Hello and welcome. My name is Kathleen Ruddy. I'm your host for today's episode of the St. Baldrick's Impact Series. We're talking with Dr. Jessica Sai. Dr. Sai is a postdoctoral scholar in pediatric oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and an attending physician in pediatric blood cancer and blood disorder center. She is dedicated to a career as a physician scientist with specific interests in pediatric brain and solid tumors, specifically to understanding their causes. She's currently studying one aspect of diffuse midline gliomas, a devastating pediatric cancer with an average survival of only 12 months. She's grateful to be a recipient of, a, of the St. Baldrick's Foundation Fellowship with support from Griffin's Guardians. Welcome, Dr. Sai. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's great to be here. We're so glad to have you. So Dr. Sai, let's jump right in. Um, brain tumors in childhood have overtaken leukemia as the most fatal type of childhood cancer. How many children are diagnosed with brain tumors each year and why are they so difficult to treat? Um, depending on the source you look at, there are about 5,000 new cases of pediatric brain tumors that are diagnosed each year in the United States. And there are really many challenges to treating brain tumors, um, primarily because there are many, many different types of brain tumors. Some are easier to treat than others, but the location of these tumors is one of the biggest challenges. So there's something called the blood-brain barrier, which is a system that actually protects our brain from factors that in our, are in your general blood circulation, meaning that certain drugs actually can't even get into the brain. And surgery can also be really challenging in certain brain regions because there are regions that are really critical for certain functions like moving, your ability to touch or sense um, on, your, on your skin or on your body and balance. And we're also learning that there are actually many different types of cells that exist in the brain, including different support cells and immune cells so um, there are a lot of challenges with brain tumors. Incredibly complex, it sounds. So brain tumors are a massive field unto themselves within the world of cancer. So yeah. why don't we just talk about the tumors you study so that we can kind of focus our chat a little bit. What is a glioma and what does science know about the causes of the type you study, diverse, um, diffuse midline gliomas? Yeah, so diffuse midline gliomas are these really just terrible pediatric brain tumors. They are universally fatal, so there is no cure, and they have a median survival of about 12 months. Um, so these are awful cancers where, you know, if I have to tell a family that this is the diagnosis, it's, it's just devastating. Um, and what we actually know about these tumors is that there is a really critical genetic event that occurs in these tumors. And they have a mutation in something called a histone. And histones are actually involved in sort of providing structural support to your DNA. And what we do know is that these histone mutations alone in diffuse midline gliomas are actually not enough for tumors to form. And so in addition to these histone mutations, there are other changes in other genes that occur in these tumors. And that is what causes the gliomas to form. So a lot of what we know actually about this specific tumor really comes from a lot of the new technology and the ability to do genetic sequencing on people's tumors. And that includes that I can look at the DNA makeup of a tumor and also RNA, which is an expression profile of the tumor. And so I would say in the last one to two decades, we've really kind of upped our ability to do that at a larger scale for mm -hmm. patients. And that must be just making a lot more potential possible or provide researchers new pathways to study to Absolutely. create more treatment options. Absolutely. It just gives us more information on exactly what the genetic profiles of these tumors are. And we're still learning more every day in the laboratory about the changes that happen in these tumors. So one of the things I've heard over time working in this field is that it's less about where a cancer occurs in a body and more about um, the genetic code and what you're exposed to and what turns on a gene that then misbehaves, if you will, I'm oversimplifying greatly, yeah. 
but then causes cancer to develop as a result of that. Is that true in brain tumors? That is true. That's actually exactly what I, what I study um, are specific genes that are normally turned off or more quiet in your body, like for you or I. And for some reason in a tumor, they're turned on and they shouldn't be turned on and they're causing cells to grow really, really quickly. And so we want to understand why they're turned on how they're causing cells to grow faster, and ultimately, is there a way to actually shut down that process so that we can stop the cells from growing and stop the tumor from growing? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So how is treating a child with a brain tumor different than treating an adult? That's a great question. There are so many differences in treating a child compared to an adult. And actually, when I was in my medical training, one of the doctors I trained with used to always say, Children are not just small adults, which I think is a really good thing to remember. So some of the differences that I can highlight are that actually first with childhood brain tumors, they're just different than adult tumors. They use different medications. The tumors behave differently. They also have different genetic changes in them. So they're just fundamentally different entities. Um, And then there are other challenges that children face that are really different from adults, right, including taking medications and procedures. So if there is an oral medication, some children actually have a really hard time swallowing pills. Um, Other children may have a really hard time with needles or having their blood drawn, right? So we have to get creative with how we do procedures and how we administer medications. And there's actually quite a bit of coordination of patient care with a child's parents or their caregivers or their caretakers. Um, And then the last thing that I can highlight is that there are actually a lot of developmental issues that I think about when treating children. So how will their treatment affect their ability to go to school? How will their treatment affect their ability to interact with their friends, their other students at school, um, their siblings? How does it impact their ability to play their favorite sports or if there's a certain activity that they really like? Um, So those are sort of huge considerations for, for taking care of children. It sounds substantial, Um, really incredibly complex set of variables that you're you're dealing with. And do you think the general public understands the differences and the needs for research that is specifically tailored to children? I don't think that the general public fully understands that they're so different. I think often cancer just gets grouped under a big bucket of cancer, and we don't really think about how we need tailored treatments for children that are very different from adult. And, you know, there's so many more adults that have cancer compared to children. And so I think that difference in number often leads to us focusing a lot on adult cancers as opposed to um, thinking about the specific needs that children have that are specific to their types of tumors. Dr. Sai, what can you tell us about recent developments in research and maybe Um, progress or work that's being done that might give new hope for patients and their families? Yeah. So like I mentioned before, my research is focused on these diffuse midline gliomas. And um, we've recently found that there's actually a gene, it's called FOXR2. And it's usually um, turned off in all the normal cells in your body. But actually in diffuse midline gliomas in a subset of them, FOXR2 is turned on and it makes cells grow very quickly. And we've done different cell models in the lab. We've actually put FOXR2 into mice and we can make tumors grow really quickly. And so much of my work is actually focused on understanding how this gene FOXR2 causes the tumors to grow. And my hope is that one day we'll figure out a way to actually turn it off. Um, And that would be fantastic because it's really only turned on in the tumor and not anywhere else in the body. So it would be a really specific, potentially targeted therapy. So I'm, I'm excited about that for these patients because I think um, this is something that we didn't know was turned on in these tumors. And there's a lot of potential in the future for more research, understanding how it works. Mm-hmm. That does sound incredible. It sounds like you're really focusing um, which um, backyard you need to dig in versus figuring out the whole um, country. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. So So St. Baldrick's, together with Griffin's Guardians, have been really proud to support your fellowship, but I'm not sure if everybody knows what a fellowship is. And could you describe that and tell us a little bit more about 
the project you're working on, the research project you're working on. Yeah, I'm super grateful for St. Paldrick's and Griffin's Guardians for supporting my fellowship. So, um, so after you go to medical school, you actually have to complete a residency to practice clinically. So I did my residency in pediatrics, and that includes the care of all children. So across all different parts of the hospital, the emergency room, intensive care, oncology, um, primary care, newborn. So you learn how to take care of all children. Um, but then after residency, if you want to specialize further within pediatrics, so I was very interested in pediatric oncology, you have to do a clinical fellowship. So in your clinical fellowship, which I did in pediatric hematology and oncology, that involves the direct care of children with blood disorders and cancers. And then it also includes really focused intensive research on some aspect of pediatric oncology that you are especially interested in, which for me is pediatric brain tumors. Um, so I mentioned um, that I study this gene called FOXR2, um, which is the project that um, St. Baldrick's and Griffin's Guardians are supporting. And, um, you know, I use a lot of cell models and we actually have patients and families that have given us diffuse midline glioma tumors that were able to grow in the lab. So I actually have cells that were originally from really generous families and patients um, that are diffuse midline glioma models that have FOXR2 turned on. So this is sort of the perfect model for me to understand how FOXR2 is working in these tumors. Um, and then I also actually work with animal models so we can actually develop brain tumor models in mice and study how these tumors work in a live animal. So my work is very collaborative. I think science is way more fun this way. And so we work with a lot of different people from different institutions with different expertise that they can bring to the table to solve this really, really tough challenge. Um, so that's sort of a little piece of what I work on. It's interesting that you mention your animal models. A, a, a very seasoned pediatric oncologist I know often says mice have saved more lives than penicillin. And um, it's really remarkable the role that they played in facilitating research that saves human lives. Yeah, that's a really good point. So what goals have you set for your career, Dr. Sai? My overarching goal is to be a pediatric neuro-oncologist and a scientist. And, you know, I ultimately want to run my own laboratory studying the biology of these tumors. And, you know, the really big overarching goal is ultimately to find better therapies for the patients that I take care of. Um, I know that we can do better. And one of the other important goals for me is actually mentoring others teaching young people about science, giving people access to learning about science who might not otherwise have these opportunities. And I get to teach scientists, medical students, college students, you know, residents, clinical fellows. So there's all sorts of different people um, that I get to teach and try to convince them that they should also work on pediatric, pediatric tumors with me. So, um, you know, ultimately I hope to have my own lab one day. Well, you're an inspiration, and I have no doubt that you will have your own lab, that you will um, mentor many young scientists and inspire young doctors to pursue an academic career in research as well. And I have no doubt that you're going to make some great contributions to the field, and that will allow you and your colleagues to save more kids' lives. So I just want to thank you because we're very grateful for talented physician scientists like you who work doubly hard to give kids a lifetime. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Sai. Thank you, Kathleen, for having me. And thank you for all the support from St. Baldrick's. It's our pleasure. From all of us at the St. Baldrick's Foundation, have a happy and safe start to your summer. And be sure to tune in again next month for our next episode of the St. Baldrick's Impact Series. Have a great day.